Well, good morning. Trust that you are wide awake and ready to go this morning, uh, and uh, it's so good to see all of you again. Uh, I did mention yesterday a couple of things on our table in the back. Uh, a lot of those are gone already. The Revelation uh, commentary is still there. Remember, uh, this afternoon later, we'll go through the whole book of Revelation uh, in one message, try to put the whole picture together for you uh, and simplify it. Uh, for those that would like to take uh, a more in-depth study on a number of topics, uh, we have a little pamphlet back there that looks like this that says, I want to be your teacher. Uh, in addition to uh, teaching at Liberty University, uh, I also have made a number of courses uh, through our television program, The King is Coming, and because I'm a professor at Liberty, uh, Liberty gives credit for those courses. Uh, there's one on a foundation of biblical studies. It's a Bible survey of Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, there are 20 lessons in that altogether. Uh, there's a basic Bible prophecy course, 12 lessons, an advanced course, 12 more lessons, and then 12 lessons just on the book of Revelation. If you want to go in more depth with that, uh, each of those also qualifies uh, for college credit uh, at Liberty. Uh, which is a fully accredited institution, so it's transferable anywhere. Uh, even a high school student can take that in advance. You can earn a certificate for each course, uh, whether you want the credit or not. Uh, you take all four courses. Uh, there's a group price for all of that. Uh, and uh, you can earn 15 hours of college credit for the four courses if you're interested, or you can earn the diploma uh, in biblical studies uh, from Liberty uh, as well. Now, Liberty also has online degree programs, bachelor's, master's, even doctorates, uh, that, that's another ball game. Uh, those are much more expensive. These are uh, much more reasonably priced uh, for uh, the average person. And then we also allow family member to take it with you for an additional $25. Uh, and so it gets to be a good deal. For a $197 course, uh, you can add on every kid in the family or a wife or a husband for another $25. They can also qualify uh, for the same certificates. So you might pick that up, take a look at that. There's an order form there about that as well uh, if you're uh, interested in taking a look at that. Uh, Liberty, again, is in uh, the town of Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, God always has a sense of humor, does amazing things in unusual places. I don't have to tell you that. You live in Saskatoon. Uh, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, Lynchburg's the end of the world, and it's one of those towns that you wouldn't go there unless you went there deliberately. It's not on a major expressway or a major highway. Uh, it's where uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell built one of the largest churches in America, uh, one of the largest television ministries, and then from that, uh, the world's largest Christian uh, college. Uh, Liberty has 13,000 students on campus. Uh, we have over 60,000 distance learning students. Uh, all over the world, uh, and uh, it's now one of the ten largest uh, educational institutions in the United States. I've had the privilege of uh, teaching there uh, since 1974, so I've seen it grow over the years uh, and seen God do some amazing things there. Uh, so if you want to go online sometime, you can go to liberty.edu, look it all up, uh, see what you think. I know it's a long ways away from here, uh, but the nice thing about distance learning is we can bring it right to your doorstep. Uh, you don't have to necessarily go there. Now, this morning, I'm going to talk to you uh, and raise the question, can we still believe in the rapture? Uh, you say, well, why would you even phrase that question? If the Bible uh, teaches that there will be a rapture, why would we even ask the question, can we still believe in the rapture? Uh, but uh, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, there have been more and more defections from the biblical teaching of the rapture, and in particular, a pre-tribulational rapture. Uh, the uh, uh, emphasis has uh, been in Scripture, obviously, on the second coming of Christ, uh, and the Bible clearly teaches that. Jesus said to the disciples, if I go back to the Father's house, John 14, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am in heaven, there you may be also. 
Now, he said that uh, on the last night before he went to the cross to the 11 believing disciples. Judas had already left the room. So the promise of his return for his own was not for the unbeliever, but only for the believers. Uh, If I go back to heaven, I will return for you to take you to myself, where? To the Father's house to be with me. So the hope of the second coming is part of the teaching of Christ. Uh, Even a theologian as liberal as uh, Emil Brunner said, a Christian faith without the expectation of the second coming is like a ladder that leads nowhere. Uh, If it's only Jesus came once, uh, he gave great teachings, he lived, he died, uh, he may or may not have risen again, but he's not coming back. You don't have the end of the story. Uh, Every major Christian denomination in the world believes in the second coming, at least in theory. It's in every doctrinal statement of every Christian denomination. Now, we may differ on when he will come, how he will come, how the details of this will work out, uh, but everybody, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Lutheran Church, the Mennonite Church, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, whatever it all says, one day Jesus will return. Uh, The only exception to that uh, are uh, some oddities. Uh, The Jehovah's Witnesses believe he already came back uh, in 1914 uh, because their founder, uh, Charles Russell, uh, for 30 years kept predicting Jesus would come in 1914. Uh, the church age would come to an end. Uh, he would set up his kingdom on earth, uh, and it would be a time of peace and prosperity. Instead, in 1914, World War I broke out, uh, and uh, Jesus did not return. So Russell said, well, he came back secretly. Uh, I'm the only one that knows it. Uh, and when 144,000 other people believe it, they'll be Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, and then he will manifest himself to the world that he's already here. Unfortunately, there are about two or three million Jehovah's Witnesses today, uh, and you can't even be one of the 144,000. They've already given away all those positions. Uh, In fact, uh, uh, he clearly taught uh, that uh, the 144,000 would not all die before the Lord revealed himself to the world, and there are, I understand, only about 40 of them still alive. Uh, They're all in their 80s or 90s. Uh, They're dying off. Uh, that's, that's one oddity. They think he already came, 1914. That's why Jehovah's Witnesses do not meet in churches. They meet in a building called a what? Kingdom Hall, because they think we're already in the kingdom. That's why they will not salute any flag, not just the American flag or the Canadian flag, any flag. God is through with nations. We're in the kingdom. Uh, God is through with the church. We're in the kingdom. That's the theology of Jehovah's Witnesses. So that would be one exception. They think Jesus already returned. Another exception would be the preterists. You say, what in the world is that? Preterist is a term in Greek grammar for the past or past tense. Preterists teach that Jesus already returned in the past in 70 A.D. He came back in the clouds, cheered on the Roman army, as they destroyed Jerusalem because he was through with the Jews, he was finished with Israel, he had no future plan for Israel, Israel had rejected the king, he gave them a generation to repent from the crucifixion and the resurrection in 30 A.D. until 70 A.D., 40 years later, they took that to be a generation, he was through with Israel, it was all over, and they were destroyed as the judgment of God against them. If you go on the Preterist website, it opens with a picture of Jerusalem burning, being destroyed. It is a very anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish movement, Uh, but Preterism basically says, Jesus said, this generation will not pass uh, till he would come. Uh, They took that to mean the generation of the first century. So in the first century... Jesus had to return, uh, or otherwise he wasn't telling the truth. So to resolve that issue, uh, they suggest that he returned 
in 70 A.D. Now, the problem is in all the prophecies of the return, Jesus comes back to rescue Jerusalem. Jesus comes back to uh, bring about his kingdom on earth. Uh, but uh, preterists say, no, he came to destroy Jerusalem. And when they apply their theory to the book of Revelation, they say the Babylon of the book of Revelation is Jerusalem. Uh, that John is using Babylon to refer to Jerusalem and that Jerusalem is destroyed and the world is uh, stunned and shocked. Uh, God is happy. Jesus is cheering uh, that he has brought about the destruction of Jerusalem and it already happened in 70 AD. Jesus already came back. There is no second coming in full preterism. We're already in the millennium. Uh, it just goes on and on. It's not a literal thousand years. Some of them say we're already in the new heaven uh, and the new earth. Uh, we are to bring in the kingdom of God on earth according to preterist theology. Uh, we are doing the work of the kingdom, not the work of the church. Uh, Dr. Ice will talk about that somewhat this afternoon uh, in dealing with concepts of the kingdom. Now, preterism may sound to you like a very strange idea. When I was in seminary 30-some years ago, uh, we were dealing with different views of the second coming, and we dealt with preterism as one of the options. And the professor said, now while this is a view that some people at times have suggested, I cannot name one living person who holds this view. Uh, Marcellus Kick, who taught it, had just died. So the professor said, uh, I don't know anybody that actually holds the view of preterism uh, today. Uh, that was 30-some years ago. Uh, there have always been a few people uh, that were not well-known uh, that were writing a few booklets here and there, holding on to that viewpoint, uh, saying that uh, uh, there would never be a rapture. Uh, w there was not going to be a tribulation period the attack of the Roman army on Jerusalem in 70 A.D., that was the tribulation. Uh, the execution of Peter and Paul by Nero, that was the tribulation period. Nero is the Antichrist. It's all over with. No second coming. Then as some people began to adopt this view, who were more visible and more popular, then they opted for what's called partial preterism. Uh, it's Jesus returned in 70 A.D. The rapture has already occurred. The second coming has already occurred. Uh, God has destroyed Jerusalem, but he will come back one day and we'll go into the general judgment and into eternity. No tribulation period, no rapture, uh, no future for Israel, uh, etc. Uh, R.C. Sproul, uh, Presbyterian theologian uh, who's written a number of very good books uh, on the glory of God or the person of God or the deity of Christ all of a sudden switch from amillennialism to preterism but partial preterism because he was a popular writer people said well if he's right about this theology or that theology surely he must be right about his view of the second coming and then they have a paradigm shift they jump from one view they don't fully understand, grab another one they don't fully understand, and say, well, if Sproul's into it, I'm into it. Uh, Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man, uh, who's been on Christian radio, uh, dealing with cults uh, of various kinds, and does a good job with that. He decides, I'm also going to become a partial preterist. So the popularization of that view by Sproul and Hanegraaff has made this uh, an option suddenly that has come back to life uh, after 100 years of being almost forgotten. Uh, they've kind of revived that view. And while you may have never heard of it, uh, it's caught on with a lot of young seminarians, uh, a lot of young preachers, because it simplifies everything. I don't have to figure out what the Bible says about the future. It already happened. It's all over with. Uh, we're just going to wait for Jesus to finally come back, judge the world, and we're into eternity. Uh, all the other details are irrelevant. They've already been fulfilled, uh, etc. So I say all of that to help us understand at the beginning uh, why the, the challenge 
Now, I'm going to show you in a moment from the Bible that the Bible clearly teaches there will be a rapture. The question is, when will it occur? Uh, how will it occur? Uh, full preterism is really a heresy because it denies the second coming. Uh, even a partial preterist realizes that. Even our millennialists realize that. Our millennialists believe Jesus will return one day, but there never will be a millennial kingdom on earth. Uh, there never will be a rapture, uh, per se. Uh, there never will be a literal tribulation period. So that's why when you go from one group to another, you'll hear different emphases in teaching uh, about the second coming. And yet I begin by reminding us every denomination except full preterists and Jehovah's Witnesses believe there will be a second coming in the future. Uh, the details are often a matter of debate. Even among those of us that believe in the rapture, there are some questions uh, that uh, we differ on uh, because uh, they're a matter of speculation. The facts of Bible prophecy are very clear. Jesus said, if I go back to heaven, I will do what? Come again. That's a fact. How we interpret when and how he comes again is a matter of biblical interpretation. And we'll do some of that here in a moment. Beyond that, other things are a matter of speculation. Uh, the Bible teaches there will be an Antichrist figure. We have to interpret who we think that's going to be, where he's going to come from. Beyond that, it's speculation as to who that might be. So here's the problem. Sometimes people preach their speculations as though they were facts. And then when they don't turn out to be true, then people throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, oh, look, you, you said Juan Carlos of Spain was going to be the Antichrist. Yeah, well, he's either dead or too old, uh, so it wasn't him. Uh, I, we had a guy show up at our meetings for several years who was convinced Prince Charles of England is the Antichrist. He even wrote a book called The Antichrist in a Cup of Tea. Uh, and uh, it's not just a British king, it's got to be Prince Charles. I said, the guy can't even run his own life, let alone the world. Come on, it's not <laughs> Prince Charles. You mark it down, years from now, if we're still here, somebody will say it's King William. Uh, he's the Antichrist. Uh, Kate's the false prophet, uh, or whatever. In America, it's... Bill Clinton is the Antichrist and Hillary's the false prophet. Uh, all that kind of stuff is just wild speculation. So we want to stay with the facts, uh, look at the interpretation, try to avoid the speculations. Those are just guesses. And yet even with good people, there are some guesses. My dear friend, Tim LaHaye, I've done 75 conferences with Tim, stayed in his home numerous times, I uh, know him like a brother or a dad. Uh, and uh, Tim says that when the rapture occurs, all your clothes are left behind. Uh, that, boosh, you're out of here, and your clothes are left behind as testimony to the fact you've been raptured. So I say, well, now, Tim, now, wait a minute. Uh, uh, you know, where do you get that? Uh, he said, well, you know, when uh, Jesus was resurrected, the burial shroud was left behind. All right. But when Elijah went up, only the shawl fell off, the prayer shawl, the mantle. Uh, and Enoch, it just says he walked with God and he was not there. Uh, it sounds like everything went. Tim, if your clothes fall off, what about your glasses? What about false teeth? What about fillings? What about artificial parts? Some of us would have more left behind than God. <laughs> you know, there's Grandma. Boy, she left a pile. None of that was real. I don't know the answer to that question. The Bible doesn't give us a detailed explanation whether your clothes go with you or whether they're left behind. Tim says, well, the clothes are left behind and then you get a robe of righteousness, hopefully fairly soon. Uh, but uh, anyway, now let's take our Bibles and let's take a look. What does the Bible say uh, in this regard? Now, there are numerous passages that deal with the rapture. Uh, John 14, I'll return for you, the believers. Take you to the Father's house. 1 Corinthians 15, we're not all going to die, but we're all going to be changed. Dead will be raised, living will be changed, etc. Uh, it's a reference to the rapture as well. But perhaps the clearest passage 
uh, is in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Now, the unique thing about this book is Thessalonica is a city in northern Greece. I've actually been there. Uh, And uh, the Apostle Paul went there very early uh, in his missionary journeys. Uh, And he plants a church there. And then later, he writes two letters back to them. And New Testament scholars agree, uh, First and Second Thessalonians are two of the earliest letters Paul wrote. Uh, they're written in the 50s A.D. They're only 20 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. So don't fall for this stuff on public television that uh, the books of the Bible were written hundreds of years later. No, they weren't. Uh, they were all written within the first century. Uh, They were all written within the lifetime of the apostles. This one written about 20 years only, after the death and resurrection of Christ. Some of you have clothes that are older than that. Uh, Now, let's take a look at Paul's message. Uh, He plants the church, he leaves town, a year or two goes by, and a couple of believers die. And so the question is, if they've died, have they missed the coming of Christ? Have they missed out? on the rapture. So he's writing this to help clarify it. Now we're going to read the text and we'll go back and examine it. Go to chapter 4, go to verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, uh, concerning them that are asleep, presumably a reference to death, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope, unbelievers. For if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Where's he going to bring them from? Heaven, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So at death, your spirit goes to heaven and it returns with God. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not prevent or precede those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend uh, from heaven uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Uh, Now, if you like to mark things in your Bible, I'd circle the words caught up. That's the reference to the rapture. Caught up together with them, the dead, in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, people who deny uh, the teaching of a rapture will often raise the objection Well, the word rapture never appears in the Bible, in the English Bible. You can't find the word rapture in the concordance. Well, you can't find the word trinity in the concordance either. The triune God is there in the Bible, Father, Son, and Spirit, but the word trinity is not there. You can't find the word Sunday in the Bible, but the Lord's Day is there, Resurrection Day. The Christians are worshiping on the Lord's Day on Sunday, but the word Sunday is not there. The concept is there. Yes, it's true. The English word rapture does not appear in the English Bible, uh, but it's translated here, caught up. Uh, We'll see in a moment. It's a Greek word, harpazo. Uh, How do you translate it? Zap. You're out of here. Snatched away, caught away, uh, etc. So let's, let's break the text down for a moment. It begins with a reminder Do not grieve like unbelievers. Uh, That's his first statement. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that are asleep. Now, he's using the word sleep here uh, as a kind of euphemism for death. It's a present active participle uh, that are sleeping. Now, he's not teaching soul sleep as the Adventists teach that uh, at death that you do not go to heaven, Uh, you're unconscious in the grave, and it's only when Christ returns that you will finally go to heaven. No, you've got to go to heaven first in order to come back with him. That's what the verse is all about. 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, uh, as he's dying, he said, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit, and then he fell asleep. It means he died. Uh, so what he's saying is, I don't want you to sorrow over those that have died since the church started, uh, like unbelievers who have no hope. That's his reminder, that every believer, even if we die, has the hope of the coming of Christ. It's still valid for both the dead and for the living. It's still a real hope. And I don't need to remind you, if you've ever been to a funeral uh, of an unbeliever, it is a very sad, uh, sobering kind of experience. Uh, when I was a young minister, my aunt called me one day. Uh, at that time, she herself uh, had not yet been born again, since has been. But she said to me, look, uh, your uncle died, my husband. And she said, uh, I-, I need you to do the funeral, if you don't mind, because he didn't make it by anybody's standards. Uh, he grew up Lutheran, but he didn't really believe it. I'm Catholic, and he didn't believe that either. He didn't believe anything, uh, so we don't even have to pretend he's in heaven because he's not. Uh, So you come and preach the funeral. It was a very sad, sobering experience, uh, etc. When I was a young pastor in my 20s in Indiana, uh, I had to do a funeral for a teenager uh, who was killed in an accident. He was an unbeliever. Family were unbelievers. But somebody in the church was related to them. They wanted me to do the funeral. And I'll never forget what happened in that funeral. Uh, I'm standing up there trying to conduct the funeral. The body's laid out in the casket. And all of a sudden, the girlfriend of the boy that's been killed leaps up out of her seat, screaming, yelling, sobbing, ran forward and dove into the casket on top of the dead body, uh, grabbing at him. No, no, I can't bring him back. I can't bring him back. I can't bring him back. They had to tear her off the body, straighten the body back up to proceed. Now let us go on. Uh, I learned there's grief for unbelievers. They have no hope of anything in the future. Death is the end. It is the cessation of existence. It's like a videotape that just quit running, uh, and it's all over with. Paul said, that's not true for Christians. That's not our position. I want to remind you, we do not sorrow like unbelievers who have no hope. Why? Because we have great hope. Then he says in verse 14, I also want to remind you of the reassurance of the fact that the dead one day will, in fact, return. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and He rose again, even so those that sleep in Jesus that have died, God will bring with him. Now, if they're merely dead and in the grave and they're not in heaven, how can God bring them with him back to earth? Can't do that. Because at death, your body goes into the grave, but your spirit goes to heaven to be with the Lord. There's a separation of the body and the spirit at that point. Now, as Christians, we tend to want to bury bodies with respect uh, of the hope of the resurrection. But I would remind us, it doesn't matter if somebody's been dead for centuries and they have disintegrated to dust. The promise of the resurrection is still real. If they were burned in a fire in an airplane crash uh, and burned to ashes, they still have the hope of the resurrection. If they were eaten by a lion in the Colosseum, they still have the hope of the resurrection. Uh, That hope is still there. The God who can speak life into existence and creation can bring the dead body back to life, and that's what he promises to do. So for Christians, we don't just believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We also believe that we ourselves one day will rise from the dead. But in the meantime, Grandpa is still in the box. Uh, Grandma is still in the grave. Uh, They haven't been resurrected yet. But at the coming of Christ, that spirit that already departed and went to heaven will come back again. There's a reunion that's going to take place there. His reassurance is Christ is coming again. 
he will bring them with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain. Now, you might like to underline alive and remain. That tells us there will be believers when Jesus returns. Sometimes I hear some cynics say, I don't think there are any real believers left. Uh, I think the things will be so bad at the time of the end, there won't even be any Christians left. No, Paul says, we that are alive and remain. So there will be people that are uh, believers that are still living when Christ comes. Now, we know from our vantage point, 20 centuries of believers have already died. They're already in the grave. First century believers, second century, fifth century, 10th century, 15th century, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, we're now into the 21st century. Those that are dead, spirits in heaven, God brings the spirit back with him at the return of Christ, and then he says, there will be people living on earth at the time that Jesus comes, and they will not precede those that have died. So we have this future active indicative uh, emphasis in the phrase, will bring. He will lead that spirit from heaven at the time of the coming, the parousia, the return, when he comes back for his own. Now, if some people try to say, well, now, wait a minute. You guys that believe in a rapture, you're teaching a two-part second coming. Uh, a rapture up in the clouds and a return back to the earth. Uh, No, they're both aspects of the second coming, just like there were multiple aspects of the first coming. Jesus' birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and even his ascension. It's all part of the first coming. Second coming includes the rapture of the believers and his return with the triumphant church in judgment at Armageddon. Uh, They're all aspects of the second coming, and there are multiple aspects of the second coming as well. Now, he not only reassures us that we will return with him, but he reminds us of the difference. The rapture takes place where? In the air. You're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The return is to the earth. There's one difference. Uh, Dr. LaHaye has about... 15 or 20 of these that he lists all together. Uh, At the rapture, you go to the Father's house in fulfillment of John 14. In the return, we come back at the Battle of Armageddon. We'll look at that later today in the book of Revelation. Uh, At the time of judgment, uh, there are significant differences between the rapture and the return so that they cannot be simultaneous. Uh, You have to separate them by some amount of time pre-tribulationalists who believe the tribulation period will last for seven years believe the rapture will occur before the tribulation. Mid-tribulationalists say in the middle of it. Post-tribulationalists say at the end of it. Uh, But you've got to put it somewhere. Now, I was uh, visiting a church uh, in St. Louis a number of years ago. A dear friend of mine was preaching. He's an amillennialist. Doesn't believe in the rapture. Uh, And he preached a whole sermon against the rapture. Uh, And the end of the sermon, he said, And so we see, in conclusion, there never will be a rapture. All we have to look forward to is trouble, trouble, and more trouble. And the audience moaned out loud in his own church. (gasps) They said. I wanted to jump up and go, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But I didn't. Afterwards, I talked to him. I said, Wilson, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know we differ on this. Uh, We're friends. But Wilson, there's got to be a rapture. You might not believe it's before the tribulation period. You might think it's at the end of the tribulation period. You might not even believe in a seven-year tribulation. You might think the whole church age is tribulation. But there's got to be a time when the dead are raised and the living are caught up, even if you put it at the end of time. There's got to be a rapture. Otherwise, you've got to take 1 Thessalonians 4, rip it out of the Bible, and throw it away. Uh, It's there. The question is simply when and how. That's the matter of difference. 
Now, to, so what happens is people who don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, then they start saying, oh, there's never going to be a rapture. Oh, the word rapture is not in the English Bible. Oh, this is a relatively new idea, uh, etc., etc., etc. Oh, this was only popularized 250 years ago. Well, justification by faith was only rediscovered 500 years ago by Luther. Uh, does that mean it's a false doctrine? No, it was taught by the apostles. It was revived by Luther. Uh, we understand that the apostles taught a rapture, uh, that the early Christians were what are called Kilias. They believed Jesus would return, set up a kingdom on earth. Uh, they were looking forward to a literal coming of Christ, uh, etc., uh, and that doctrine, uh, while it is suppressed in the Middle Ages, uh, doesn't mean it wasn't part of the original teaching of the Bible in the first place. So we want to look at what does the Bible say and what does the Bible teach and what was the opinion of the early apostles. For Paul, his assurance was there are those that are going to die. Spirit's going to go to heaven. And when Jesus comes, your spirit returns with him. The body will be resurrected reunited with the Spirit in a literal resurrection. Why? To prepare for a literal millennial kingdom. So why do we have to have a resurrected body if we already went to heaven? Because you're only there in a spirit form. You've got to have that literal body to return with Christ to reign in His literal kingdom on earth in the future. Now, if you dismiss the kingdom as merely spiritual and not literal, uh, then you're going to dismiss the idea of the resurrection of the body as literal and make it spiritual. And then you end up with people today even saying, oh, even the resurrection of Jesus wasn't literal. It was just a spiritual resurrection. He just sort of oozed out of the grave. Ah, uh, no. The word resurrection, anastasis, means to stand up, uh, not ooze out. Uh, you stand up out of the grave in the body. Uh, in a real, literal, physical body. Even Job understood that when he said, even if my flesh rots, yet in my flesh I will see God. Though he slay me, yet my Redeemer lives. Now, he believed in a literal resurrection. Daniel, at the end of the book of Daniel, is told, Daniel, you're not going to understand all of this right now. Seal it up, go your way, but in the end, you will stand in your allotted inheritance. Jewish people understand what that means. In his tribal inheritance, you will stand there. The book of Daniel ends with an emphasis on the resurrection of Christ, uh, the resurrection of the body for the believer. That, that's part of real biblical theology, Old Testament and New Testament, and it's certainly part of Christian theology. So at some point, you've got to go up in the air, caught up, harpazoed, snatched away, and at some point we've got to return to earth triumphantly with Christ. Now notice at his return, when he comes, it says he will descend, literally come down from the heavens into the clouds, and we that are alive and remain will not, the King James says prevent, uh, but it literally means proceed from the Greek term Fanto, we will not go before them. Why do you have to resurrect the dead first? Well, because they're at least six feet under, uh, to give them a chance to catch up with the living so that we are then caught up together, this text says, uh, with three signals, the triumphant shout, uh, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. It's the last trumpet for the church age. It's not the last trumpet in the Bible. You've got trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation that deal with the time of the tribulation. Uh, you've got trumpets that have to do with eternity as well. It's the last trumpet for the church age. It's called in the Greek text the eschate, the eschaton trumpet. Uh, it is the uh, eschaton, the end of the age for the church age. It doesn't mean it's the end of history at that point in time. But when the rapture occurs, the trumpet sounds, the archangel shouts, and the dead in Christ will rise. Uh, the term in Christ is used throughout Paul's epistles to refer to church age believers. Uh, the believers are in Christ. Uh, by faith, he is in us through the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a unique designation for the church. Now, there's a difference of opinion here. Some say, well, maybe at the rapture, the Old Testament saints are raised then as well as the New Testament 
church age saints, well, you've still got to resurrect any believers that die in the tribulation period. So you've got to have a resurrection of tribulation saints. Most pre-tribulationalists believe that at the rapture, only the church is raptured. That in Christ is a unique designation for the church. Only later will the Old Testament saints be resurrected along with the tribulation saints to enter into the kingdom because Jesus said in the kingdom I'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, literally and we will uh, drink the cup in the kingdom. Uh, He sees the kingdom as a literal kingdom in the future uh, that then unites the whole family of God. We'll look at that uh, later today in the book of Revelation. Uh, But at this point, uh, you have this unique designation for the bride of Christ. The bridegroom is coming back for the bride because he's taking her to the wedding. Uh, The rapture then comes from uh, the Greek word harpazo. It's in the Greek lexicon. So when somebody says to you, the rapture is not even in the Bible. Yes, it is. The concept is there. The English word rapture is not there. The Greek word is there, and it's in the Greek lexicon, harpazo, snatched away, caught away. It's an interesting term. Uh, Jesus, on the one hand, says uh, of Satan, he is a thief. It's the Greek word kleptos, from which we get kleptomaniac. Uh, He's a thief, a robber that comes to steal, etc. And uh, beware of that. But then he also says... I will come as a thief, a kleptos. Uh, I will come to do what? Harpazo, snatch away uh, the church uh, at a time that nobody expects. He says even to believers, keep watching for nobody knows when your Lord will come. You don't know when he's going to come. Setting dates is a total waste of time. We can understand the time is near, the stage is set, I need to be ready But I don't know if I have five minutes, five days, five years, 50 years, or 500 years. Probably don't have 500 years, uh, given everything we talked about last night. Uh, Too much stage setting going on for that, I think. But how much time is left? I don't know. Now, you don't know for sure you're going to make it to the rapture. You hope you will. You could walk out of here this afternoon and get hit by a car. Uh, You could be in the presence of the Lord today, with or without a rapture. But the rapture could potentially occur at any point in time. Uh, You don't have to wait for the Antichrist to come on the scene. He's not going to come on the scene until after the restrainer is removed. Uh, Only then can the Antichrist come on the scene. Uh, So Satan himself doesn't know the date of the rapture. Jesus said nobody knows the time, not even the angels. Satan is a fallen angel. Satan is not God. He is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He's brilliant. He's powerful, but he is not all-knowing. So all he can know is the Bible teaches a rapture. I can read the newspaper. I can read the Bible. I can think I got to get ready. There are big issues coming along. So can Satan indwell the heart of a Hitler to try to kill the Jews? Yeah. But does that mean Hitler's the Antichrist? No. Could he have been? He could have been, but he wasn't. Or could it have been Stalin or whoever or whatever? Satan is almost restlessly always looking around for somebody to potentially become the Antichrist, but his hands are tied. He doesn't know when the rapture will occur. He can't indwell anybody to be the Antichrist until after the rapture. So I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm not even looking for the Undertaker. I dodged him once. I'm looking for the Upper Taker. Uh, I'm waiting for the trumpet to sound, etc. But it will happen. Somewhere, sometime, there will be. The the rapture word in English comes from the Latin rapio or rapere uh, to translate, to zap you out of here. The old theologians called it the translation. Not translate the Bible, but translate your body out of here to transform it, uh, to get it out of here, etc. Rapture caught up. It's the catching up. It's the departing away uh, that is taught uh, in this passage. So even if you don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, you've got to have a rapture somewhere. You've either got to put it in the tribulation, after the tribulation, uh, or you've got to say there's no tribulation, but at the end of history, the dead will be raised and the living will be raptured. 
So forget all this goofy talk about, oh, there never will be a rapture. Oh, this idea of people disappearing is crazy. No, it's biblical. It's right in the Bible. To deny that is to deny the Bible. Uh, the question is simply when. Good people can differ on when, but it's got to happen somewhere at some time, and there are plenty of examples of raptures in the Bible. Uh, so we can't say, well, this idea is never heard of. No, Enoch walked with God and voosh, he disappeared. He was not. That's a rapture. Elijah was caught up in the chariot of fire, alive. Boosh, he's out of here. That's a rapture. Philip, the disciple, is preaching, or not disciple, the, the uh, early deacon. Uh, Philip is preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the Bible says he was harpazo, caught away, and dropped down in another place. He was temporarily raptured. God picked him up and put him someplace else instantly. Paul says, I was harpazoed, caught up into the third heaven. Was he temporarily raptured? Or was he caught up in a vision? Sounds like he was raptured away. Uses that same term. Uh, you have Jesus in the ascension. Is it kind of a rapture? Uh, when people are caught up, caught away. Uh, another one you could add to the list. Two very clear examples in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. The two witnesses. The two Jewish witnesses are preaching the gospel to the Jewish people during the time of the tribulation. They're in Jerusalem, preaching in Jerusalem, in the city where the Savior was crucified, it says. And the Antichrist kills them. They've been preaching for three and a half years, presumably the first half of the tribulation period. Then they're killed, and their dead bodies lie in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. So that gets you on into the second half of the tribulation then. And uh, the whole world sees their dead bodies lying there uh, for three and a half days. They send presents to each other. They celebrate because these preachers are dead and we don't have to listen to this anymore, etc. Again, I remember a pastor in the 1950s commenting on that, saying, I don't know how they could lie there dead uh, in the street and the whole world could see them uh, and rejoice in only three and a half literal days. But my guess, he said, would be it's probably got something to do with television. Uh, yeah, we know how that happens now. Satellite transmission in real time. You can be in Saskatoon, Toronto, Washington, D.C., London, Moscow, and Jerusalem instantly on live TV. That can literally be fulfilled. Then what happens? After three and a half days, Revelation 11, the Spirit of God entered into them and they stood up. Boy, would I like to be watching CNN on that day. Uh, we're here in Jerusalem with the cameras. The dead bodies are still lying there. The parties still go, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're moving around. Uh, they're moving around. They're getting up. Oh, they're getting up. Oh, uh, wow, they're getting up. And then all of a sudden, Faust are going up. They're out of here. He snatches them away. They're raptured into heaven. There's a rapture, the two witnesses. Why would God... Let him preach halfway through the tribulation period. Let him get killed and finally rapture him out, I think, to convince the world that the rapture had already occurred three and a half years earlier. Uh, that the rapture where millions of people disappeared was not an alien abduction or whatever other explanation people try to come up with. And he shows them a mini rapture at that point to convince them that the rapture has already occurred. Then it's at that point you have the breaking of the treaty. The Antichrist is persecuting the Jews, uh, driving the remnant into the wilderness, uh, etc. And everything the last three and a half years of great tribulation then leads up to the final culmination of the Battle of Armageddon. That has to do with the return, not the original rapture. You're caught away in the rapture. The living are caught up. So why a rapture? Well, it's a reunion. We're caught up to be with the Lord forever. And so shall we always be with the Lord. And then the purpose of the rapture. Why do you have to have a rapture? First of all, you have to take the bride to the Father's house in fulfillment of John 14. We're caught away to the Father's house. Secondly, at some point, the believers have to go to the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema Seat Judgment where we stand before the Lord to receive our rewards. 
Uh, thirdly, you have to get the church up to heaven to the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation 19. The marriage obviously takes place in heaven. So you've got to have a rapture before the marriage. The problem for post-tribulationalists who also believe in a seven-year tribulation would be if the church goes through the tribulation, goes up at the end of the tribulation, you've got to get her all the way up, have the marriage instantly, and come right back down again. It's kind of like a yo-yo elevator view. Whoop, you're up, you're back uh, instantly. Uh, there are lots of problems, I think, with that view. If all the saved people get raptured at the end of the tribulation period, there are no saved people on earth left to go into the millennial kingdom. So you don't have anybody to populate the millennial kingdom with, except people in glorified bodies. That's a whole problem in itself. Uh, you don't have enough time for all these events to take place, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, and uh, we'll see that later today in Revelation uh, and the last reference there should be 1914, uh, that the marriage of the Lamb takes place in heaven. You receive the white robe, and those robed in white return in the triumph. Got to get the church up to heaven to the marriage. Got to get her back down to earth in the return when he returns, speaks the word, and slays the army of the Antichrist. So there are lots of reasons for a rapture. We're going to resurrect the dead, rapture the living, be reunited with Christ and the whole family of God, go to the judgment seat, go to the marriage, and then come back in the triumphal return. So at the end of the passage, he says what? You've got to then give great reassurance and comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, reasons for a pre-tribulational rapture. Jesus promise, I'll come back for you, the believers. His instruction, keep watching, be ready, pray that you escape the hour of trial that is coming. The church of Philadelphia, you'll be kept out from the hour of trial that is coming, not through it. You don't send the church through the tribulation and beat up the bride of Christ to get her ready for the wedding. I've heard people try to say, well, the church has always endured tribulation and trouble and persecution. Right from man, from Satan, but not from God. The tribulation is described as the wrath of Christ, the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of God. The church is not the object of the wrath of Christ. The world's wrath, yes. Satan's wrath, yes, but not Jesus' wrath. Jesus went to the cross, died for our sins, and took the wrath of God against our sin on the cross. We're not be Therefore, we are not appointed under wrath but to escape that wrath that is coming. That's the whole promise of the rapture, and that's why I think it's got to take place before the tribulation period because it's a time of wrath. Uh, otherwise, you've got to, Jesus saying, I'm going to beat the bride up. Uh, people say, well, to purify the bride. Well, what about 20 centuries that have already died? They don't get in on this. Only the last one does. Uh, and uh, that's like Protestant purgatory. Uh, I'm going to beat it out of you to make you spiritual enough to go to heaven. No, you're only spiritual enough to go through the blood of Christ that changes and transforms your life. Uh, thirdly, the persecuted woman in Revelation 12 is the mother of Christ, not the bride of Christ. We'll talk about that later today. The church is not the object of divine wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. The rapture is imminent. It's the blessed hope of the believer. It's instantaneous. It's in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, in a flash. It's unique for those that are in Christ. Uh, it precedes the Bema seat. It precedes the marriage. It precedes Armageddon. Uh, those things alone, and you can add a hundred other things, uh, tell me it's got to occur before the time of tribulation. The reason I'm pre-millennial is I believe the book of Revelation makes it clear there will be a literal kingdom on earth and six times Revelation 20 says a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. You get the idea. He wants you to know it's a thousand years. And then I'm pre-tribulational because I have a very high view of the relationship of Christ to the bride. That Jesus loves the bride, died for the bride, gave himself for the bride. And didn't come to beat up the bride. He comes to rescue the bride at the rapture. He beats Satan at his own game. He comes as a thief in the night. The world's not expecting this. 
And just as everything's starting to build toward this great climax, Jesus sweeps in. He's the kleptos that snatches away the church and leaves Satan frustrated. Uh, The rapture occurs. The church has been taken to heaven, and Satan pours out his wrath on the world. The world's wrath brings it planet to a point of destruction. We'll see that later in the book of Revelation. Therefore, the whole promise of the Bible is, if you know Christ as your Savior and you're in Him, the hope is He's coming again and He's coming for you. Now, do me a favor. Turn to the person on your right and on your left, one of whom you probably came with. Look them right in the face and say, Jesus is coming again. And then ask them, is He coming for you? All right, do that. The answer to that question, the answer determines your eternal destiny. Thank you. God bless you.